morning, everyone. Um, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome my old friend uh, from, uh, well, not old yet, but <laughs> from a long, long time ago from uh, our college days together at the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi, and actually even before that. But, um, so um, I've known him for about maybe 50 years or something, <laughs> but um, he is uh, now the George Ellery Hale Professor of Astronomy and Planetary Science um, at Caltech, where he is in two divisions, the Physics, Math, and Astronomy Division, um, as well as the Geology and Planetary Sciences Division. And he has been the director of the optical labs at Caltech, uh, which, if you know, Caltech's uh, command of JPL and all the other observatories is a big deal for, he's been director of that for many years. And um, I have uh, his CV here, but I can tell you, at least roughly speaking, <laughs> that he has, uh, uh, he's a member of the US National Academy of Sciences, the Indian National Academy of Sciences, uh, the Royal Society of London, of the, uh, um, let me see, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and so on. Uh, he has won many prizes, including NSF's Alan Waterman Prize, uh, Presidential Young Investigator Award, uh, Fellowship from the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, um, the Helen Warner Award of the American Astronomy, Astronomical Society, um, the Jansky Prize of Associated Universities Incorporated, and the Dan David Prize from Israel. Um, so um, he's a very celebrated astronomer. Um, the thing I remember most about him is he's A, a lot of fun to work with, and uh, B, he is very dynamic. So <laughs> I've seen him work uh, like crazy. Um, and he's done a lot of things when he was, a, even as a grad student, um, he discovered the millisecond pulsar. Uh, until then, uh, we knew only the slower kind, and these are much faster pulsars. And since then, he has been interested in the study of compact astronomical objects. And he sent us a talk abstract, which was very complicated, with lots of astronomy. And so we said, mm, well, we like that, but, uh, <laughs> And so then he created a whole new talk um, to talk about um, the, um, the astroinformatics aspect of astronomy. So I'm very thankful to him for having done that. Uh, hopefully that's more um, understandable and interesting to us here. Um, at the same time, feel free to ask him questions on astronomy in general um, after the talk. So, Without any further ado, uh, any of us, okay. Thank you. So, uh, one of my Japanese colleagues remarked this is such a nice Okinawa shirt. Uh, well, I have to say this is a shirt from Hawaii because it's been a lot of, we're an observatory in, uh, on the Big Island. And of course, there are similarities. Uh, uh, <coughs> You know, between the Okinawan shirts and that from Hawaii. I, to, I guess I have to buy one from Mango House on my way out. <laughs> um, so it's a pleasure to be here. It's always uh, nice to be in Japan. Uh, there are two things I always liked about Japan. Uh, one is you don't have to do it. There's no tipping, so it takes all the stress away. You know? <laughs> Just go, you pay, there's sort of no too much, too little, and so on. Uh, other one is I love trains and they really depart on time. But today I discovered a slight side effect of that particular thing, which I always like. You know, uh, the institute had arranged a taxi to pick me up. It said 9:45. You know, I was uh, came a little early, uh, maybe 9:42, um, and there was a taxi uh, with oyster placard. So I said, okay, that's me. So I got in. And the uh, taxi driver said, well, I can't leave right now. And I said, OK. <laughs> um, then I said, no, no problem. Um, I do all what all scientists do, and there's a lot of time to catch up, which is you start getting on the email. That's, all, that's what you do, right? 
that's the stuff you do in between doing science now and then. Um, and then at 9, I noticed that 9.51 or 52 he left. Okay, so we reached exactly 10, which is where it says to be greeted by Dr. Purvahit and the auditorium. Uh, and then I remembered, yeah, this is of course the case in uh, JR a few years ago, I now remember suddenly, they issued an apology because one of their trains left the station one minute early. Okay, so this uh, of course uh, is very impressive, I must say. Okay, enough of that. Um, so uh, I'll be making some broad statements and I expect uh, actually for those of who, oh, I guess most of you don't know me, but I'd love to be challenged, uh, absolutely. There's nothing as good as an intellectual fight I welcome, in fact. So I'll make some statements. I'll try to make it a little outrageous to get you to challenge. I know this is Japan, but uh, there are some Jap non-Japanese, and maybe by induction, please uh, challenge me. It's fine, completely fine. Uh, okay, so let me start off. Uh, so I'll make an assertion that uh, most of science is phenomenological, actually. Um, astronomy, like biology, geology, and you can add a new subject, exoplanetology. These are phenomenological subjects. Well, what does that mean? It means uh, you go out and observe, measure, and do things uh, because you can't imagine them yourselves. Okay, that's what phenomenology is, uh, which is what most of science really was, and the Amazing success of physics in the last century has, I think, warped many people's idea of what science is. Um, and uh, uh, I think, though, that these subjects, which will be driven by phenomenology, will in fact now be the subjects of this century. Uh, you know, what's the big thing you've heard from fundamental physics in the last 20 years? Okay, they got the mass of the Higgs boson. Yeah, fine. Okay, it's one number, we're done. Uh, it's not particularly a thriving field right now. Um, no, it's true. It's not a particularly thriving field. It's an important field, uh, but it's not uh, something you get up and uh, read every day. Something's happening. Okay. Uh, but uh, these subjects are uh, phenomenology phenomenal is about to take off, and uh, and that's where, and my thesis is that because they're very driven by technology and uh, therefore they are going to take off. Okay, so let's understand what the, what the phenomenologic subjects have in common. First, you've got to go and discover. That means you have to go and map things out. So let's start with something which is usually derided, which is, uh, okay, you're stamp collecting, you're butterfly collecting. So yeah, it's fine. You go out you know, with your eyes or a camera or whatever, you take pictures of uh, you know, things in, out there in the wilderness. And you realize, you know, first the butterflies, they're winged creatures, though, but they're not the same. Grasshopper and butterfly, dragonfly and birds, they're not the same at all. So first you have to just go discover. Okay, then you start seeing patterns, and that's when you'll say there is a family called butterflies. They have a certain mechanical way of doing things, and eventually there's a deep molecular basis of who they are. Birds are also a mechanical way of doing things. So that takes uh, what is what I call a, a, system, a search for patterns, okay. Um, and once you have these patterns organized, that's when you come up with what you call physical models. Okay, and this is where physics enters, and uh, it's been spectacularly successful in a certain aspects of understanding, uh, <clears throat> which is uh, uh, physics is a subject that aims to build models by uh, first coming with some laws and eventually rules to explain this or to account for these patterns and then say, can I reduce it? Okay, so phenomenology is all about complexity and classification, and physics is all about reducing it. And the goal of physics is to reduce all that to as few uh, rules as possible, and ultimately to a few numbers. So in that sense, the success of astrophysics in the last 20 years has been spectacular. You can specify the geography and makeup of the universe in seven numbers which is like really spectacular. Of course, seven numbers, and then you have to know some rules, which are the rules of GR to explain the dynamics, and certain rules of deep fundamental physics to explain the particle and map and composition. Okay, those are some, some rules there. Okay, um, so uh, this is sort of phenomenological subjects. Now let me come to mathematics and technology. 
Now, there are some mathematicians that will completely astonish you first and then they'll irritate you next by telling you mathematics and technology are the opposite ends of this thing. They're they the same things, actually, but opposite in some ways. Okay, so uh, mathematics is an integral part of natural sciences. And uh, uh, mainly because it allows one to compute signals. It's a computational device. I know that many mathematicians will say, what about all the pure thinking with the symmetry and all that? No, no, no. It, there's like a lot of literature out there, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and explaining theories and all that. But actually, the origin of mathematics lies in poetry and in practical results. Uh, what you call as number theory. There's a fantastic uh, lecture by a field theorist, a field medal winner, uh, <clears throat> on uh, the origin of number theory from counting the, the number of uh, you know, long and short uh, uh, vowels in poetry uh, goes to about 8th century uh, AD. Um, and practical results is obvious. That's sort of, uh, if you want to stack uh, uh, oranges uh, and you say, what is the best, what's the way I can stack oranges maximally without it falling down, which all children like to do. If you're given a lot of oranges, immediately you start this head and shapes. Okay, that's sort of math. That is really mathematics. Um, so the unreasonable success of physics and mathematics in particularly where you formulate a physical law and then from that you make a prediction uh, has been really spectacular in, uh, in, uh, partic in particularly physics. Has, I would say, led to a, a wrong idea that somehow that this is the basis. It's almost, you even have books like God was a mathematician and all that sort of silly things. It's not true. These are all our, our constructs to compute signals. And sometimes you see a success, okay? And sometimes when you go out in the wilderness, you see a rare animal and you don't attribute that to God or any such thing, you attribute to luck, okay? Um, so uh, astronomy has had a fantastic growth of, this, of all the phenomenological sciences, which I would largely count geology, astronomy, and biology. Astronomy had a fantastic growth. Uh, and, uh, but biology has overtaken that thing just in terms of acceleration. Uh, but astronomy has a very valid uh, 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 branch of astronomy called theoretical astrophysics. And I'm sorry to say there is nothing equivalent to that in, in biology. There is no real fundamental theory of biology yet. It will come, it will come, it will take a while. Remember, astronomy had a very long history, whereas biology in that sense is very recent. Okay, so let me give an example of what I mean by mathematics technology because these are somewhat unusual ideas. I completely admit that what I'm telling you are really not what you call mainstream. Okay, so <clears throat> let me give an example of my thesis. So let's start with planetary motions. Okay, centuries ago, thousands of years ago, uh, people, at that time amateur astronomers, Notice that there are two kinds of things in the sky. There's a pattern of objects that maintain distance with each other. The same pattern rises and comes back year after year. And then there are a few bright objects that move with respect to this. They are the wanderers, that, i.e., what you now call as the planets. Okay? So this was known, and these planets are confined to a certain, certain uh, plane, a very important plane, so much so they are all the astrological signs come with the planets. Right? This plane is where all the astrological 12th signs, animals, or whatever you want culture had, okay? With the very first telescope, i.e. technology, when Galileo's first telescope was put together, it may look small to you today, but remember it was the first telescope, the jump in telescope diameter went from zero to maybe 10 centimeters. Well, that is infinite jump, actually, in technology. Okay, <clears throat> so, oops. There's this. Ah. So as soon as it peered at the moon and the moons uh, and Jupiter, he discovered the moons of Jupiter. Well, that was a major finding to realize that the bodies that orbit other bodies. In fact, that if, if Galileo had really thought through, he'd have very quickly understood the role of gravity. But it had to take you know a century later for Newton and the Apple and all that sort of stuff to happen to understand that gravity is there to keep these objects going around in a circle. Okay. <coughs> Now, Brahe made very careful positions of planetary positions, uh, observations of planetary positions. So, you may not appreciate this, but he convinced the king of Denmark to invest what amounts to about 7% of GDP in a year to build the, the great observatory. Okay, that's a lot of money. There's probably nothing in parallel uh, comparable to modern day timescales. 
maybe the Apollo program would amount. Well, let's say that's about 3%, plan for 20 years, yeah, okay, that would be fine. Uh, that would exceed that, but nothing other than that, okay. So, and the, the, the result was a catalog at uh, minute position, also planetary positions, okay. Uh, uh, he was extreme, he must have been an extremely skilled guy then. I said, how did he, this guy, because you know, one of the things that I do in my position is, ideas I, uh, okay, let me tell you, uh, Fidel Castro once said ideas are cheap, and I thought that was a bit strange statement, but I now, uh, over time I realized ideas are very cheap, actually, they're easy to come by. In fact, we end of the day we can get together, you know, I like single malt scotch. I'll tell you after that, ideas go even much faster. Okay, the main problem in life is to make the execute these ideas, which usually requires raising money. So I'm always interested in how people raise money. So it turns out that uh, Bry promised uh, the king, he was an alchemist, so at some point he must have in his NSF proposal said, the goal, aim of our observatory is to convert whatever base metals into gold. Okay, but of course he did exactly what we all do. We write some aid, some nice looking BS, and then get the money and do what we want anyway. <laughs> okay, so um, then he left this stuff, he died, and Kepler is the one who distilled this into the, now you see, we had already discovered the patterns, but the patterns now become rules, which are the kept laws of Kepler. Okay, patterns are general statements, but rules are very exact things. There's Kepler's first law, the second law, and the third law, okay? And those he made, which led, as soon as uh, Newton developed a theory of gravity, which said, okay, there's an inverse square uh, law for force. Uh, then it took 20 years for Newton and Leibniz to develop the, the, the mathematical tools. So this is what I'm saying, mathematical, mathematics is technology, actually. Uh, and just because they don't look like engineers, we confuse them with something else. So it took them 20 years, okay, for these two people to develop calculus, which is needed to solve any equation of dynamics, because force has second derivative, and so you will have to learn. Okay, that led to modern mechanics. Gauss, in fact, computed trajectories. So you can see they're all mathematicians here. And in fact, invented what you now call as the least square method, and made a prediction of a minor body, I think it would be a series or something, and said where it would be, okay? So you can see the beautiful example of phenomenological subject and the role of mathematics and technology, all in this what I consider the most classic example. Okay, um, so now let's uh, switch to astronomy. Uh, so here's my view of astronomy. Um, between 1930 and 70, so modern astronomy, roughly speaking, is about maybe 120 years old, roughly speaking, if you wish. Uh, the real basis of astronomy begins, I would say, with uh, the Sahai equation and spectroscopy, which is our ability to look at a spectrum and say something about composition and temperature and density. Right now, you can talk about physical units. Okay, so the basis for this progress of stars was spectroscopy from large telescopes, and and the physical model was Sahai's equation. Okay, between 50 and 80, the synthesis of elements was understood. Now, some of you don't think about this too much, or if you're a chemist, you assume the periodic table is granted to you. But remember, when the universe began, the periodic table only had hydrogen and helium. It would have been a fantastic time to be a chemistry major because <laughs> there would be no chemistry, so classes would be almost nothing. Okay, so the synthesis of elements was understood, and you know, this was a major, the, the, the real details for all these cross-sections it is really all about nuclear physics and Manhattan Project. In fact, all the guys who did Manhattan Project later ended up working on what you would later was called as nuclear astrophysics. Okay, <clears throat> um, neutron star black holes. Wow, they're only found, they're not, uh, you can sit around and think as much as you want uh, until it's there, it ain't there. So uh, this radio and X-ray, radio engineers and X-ray physicists who understood X-ray methodologies applied to the heavens and discovered these objects. Uh, to me, the most impressive, oh, well, these are all very impressive. The one impressive because I can relate to is, is sort of during my sort of you know, peak uh, production time is uh, cosmology understood. I, I find this the most fascinating thing, that, that you sit around and uh, contemplate, but then you go and make measurement of small structures in the universe and they grow. And we can actually explain this quantitatively now. Okay, but this rely on mapping the sky at centimeter wave technology with very, very sensitive receivers. <laughs> Otherwise, there'd be no understanding of cosmology. Otherwise, it would be stuck with the GR equations. 
and there are many solutions to that. Okay, the growth of galaxies, okay, so it tells you the last structure, then how did matter get organized in galaxies and then star formation, and that's all due to, I would say, the fundamental technology that necessary is optical uh, CCDs, which is commercial, though first invented in the commercial realm, but part, but really developed by astronomers, and near infrared detectors, which is still a very strong defense activity. Okay, uh, those are the technologies that drove all this progress. Okay, so now let me get into my main part of this, with this background, which is time domain astronomy. <coughs> So for a long time, the idea, uh, naturally, the first thing you do when you get into a subject, you map. You try to understand the landscape, okay? So uh, first thing you do in astronomy is try to understand the landscape, which is to say, how is this, what does the sky look like at near infrared wavelengths, radio wave bands, x rays, and so on, okay? So that's what astronomers did in the previous century. And uh, so we had a pretty, comprehensive multiband understanding all the way from literally 10 megahertz to something of the order of 10 to the to cosmic rays which are like uh, 10 to the 21 electron volts so that's a huge range of uh, energy scales understood okay so once you map the sky what's the next thing you do well the only thing left next is to map it again and again to look for things that are changed and that's in brief is time domain astronomy so if you look up once, it's astronomy, and if you look up more than once, it's time domain astronomy. And what do you find? You find uh, new stars, supernovae, novae, or moving objects, because a moving object is not in the same place when you look up twice, okay? Which means, and moving objects are all basically solar system objects, asteroids and debris and so on and so forth. Okay, so much of my talk will focus on supernovae, because time domain astronomy is a methodology. It's like saying, after you invent the electron microscope, you know, you can't really give a talk on it and say what it is, but you have to then choose something special in that. And that's why I'll talk mainly on supernovae. And uh, so uh, let me go back. The uh, time domain astronomy and the study of supernovae began with uh, Professor Fritz Wicke. He was the first physicist appointed to the astrophysics at Caltech in 1926 27. Caltech had received $6 million from the Rockefeller Foundation for the construction of the 200-inch project uh, led by George L. Levy Hale. And they realized they didn't have an astronomer, so... And Zwicky was, a, if you ask me, the three great people I admire in the last century in astronomy, and Zwicky is one of them. Uh, he was absolutely brilliant. He held fundamental patents on jet engines. Uh, he's well known in the, uh, the departments of philosophy. Uh, and uh, he was the most imaginative, um, sort of a very lateral thinking person. Uh, and uh, surprising is that he uh, did everything by himself. So Zwicky yeah, he's observing, he reduces the, develops the photographic plates, makes the measurements, and writes single author papers. And that's what he did for most of, or almost all of his life. I respect that immensely, okay? If you use that criteria, we would hardly be anywhere. And anyway, I like Zwicky, I admire him so much that I call everyone uh, by, measure everyone by the Zwicky scale. Mostly I meet micro Zwicky, this is pretty. Once in a while I meet a milli Zwicky. Okay, so he started this modern field of time domain astronomy uh, with an 18-inch uh, Schmidt telescope at Paloma, and this is 1936. Uh, Barney and Zwicky um, uh, showed there are two types of explosions. Uh, now, many of us use the word phase space. Okay, this term was not this particular, he used it in a different, he gave it a different name, morphological classes. But phase, the concept of phase space and exploration goes to Zwicky. So anytime you use phase space, you have to remember it's Zwicky, okay? Uh, and there's a whole uh, textbook on this, uh, uh, the phase uh, morphological approach to science and so on. So in a phase space, you try to look at phenomena with some major variables plotted. Okay, it's simple now, but like many things which are simple now, they're more not obvious then. So here it's the time scale of the event. So you look at something in the sky, a new star or a new event has come up, and you say, how long can I see it? Well, there are all sorts of bias issues. Okay, there's a difference for bigger telescope here, what is sensitive. And so don't get worried. Life is full of biases. Uh, you couldn't live without biases, actually. Uh, it's a part of evolutionary biology. So, uh, the, uh, so let's not worry on what time scale, what exactly is the event. So one day, 10 days, 100 days, and one year. That's how that phenomenon is visible. And this is how bright it is. 
Okay, now astronomers use a unit called magnitude, and I can tell you there are two reasons why we do that. The first one is, uh, uh, first of all, it's kind of a weird thing. It's got like minus, so as you go up, it's brighter and in a log sense, and it's got all these negative numbers and so on. The reason number one is straightforward. You know, uh, many of these spaces are actually pretty bright guys, and we really don't want them to come into astronomy, which is actually a fairly easy field. So once you put like negative numbers mean more negative and log and so on, that seems to get them all confused. And the ones who do persist, okay, uh, you then tell them it's all in solar luminosities. And then finally, the ones who are still there, we just want to use CGS. That gets rid of most places that I know like immediately because they use MKS. Anyway, so there are all these units. The sun would be minus four on this scale here. Okay, and, and two and a half units in this is 10. Fact of that. So they distinguish novae, which are ordinary surface explosions on the white box, and supernovae. And we now know these are thermonuclear explosions. So these are stars where carbon and oxygen, there's a core, let's say, about a solar mass of carbon and oxygen. Okay. It's, under, it's uh, in equilibrium with degenerate pressure, balance, and gravity. And then there's a nuclear ignition that goes off, and the carbon and the oxygen fuse all the way to iron, and you know this is something very special about iron, because iron is the most stable nucleus. You can't fuse iron to get energy. That's why fusion reactors will all involve uh, uh, elements below the iron peak, and fission will be above the iron peak. Okay, I'm sure all of you remember this from seventh grade or something like that. Okay, it's a joke. I didn't learn this in seventh grade. <laughs> okay, uh, so these are the fusion reactors, uh, thermonuclear explosions. And, uh, okay, so what's a supernova? Well, supernova is a star that comes up. Uh, it wasn't there a few days ago or you know, last night, and then it's there. So this, uh, this is a galaxy called M51, Messier 51, also called the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's a beautiful galaxy if uh, you have an amateur astronomer or an amateur astronomer uh, should look at M51. Uh, uh, and uh, it produces supernova once about every 10 years. Our galaxy, we believe the rate is about once every 100 years. The last visible one was about 400 years ago. Okay, so it is this that new elements are made. So elements are made when stars undergo fusion reactions throughout their life, uh, which is the so-called low Z elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, the stuff uh, that you know is important for organic chemistry. Largely, is made when stars are living, but the uh, high Z elements uh, are made uh, when the star dies, and the very highest Z elements are made when a star dies twice. Okay. Okay. So, um, so very quickly. Um, so this is how it began. So what it is? Well, I'll, I'll very play the movie twice. So what you are seeing here is a redshift, uh, that, and it's showing you the structure on very large scales, on hundreds of megaparsec scales here, and it's showing how matter is getting organized. So let me. Uh, while this beautiful structure is evolving, uh, by the way, if you're a biologist, you may even think this thing I'm showing you a biology. It's not. It's, really the structure of the universe. Um, so um, it's still hard for me to believe this. When the universe began, the energy and matter density at this place, to compare to any other place, was the same to one part in 10 to the 5. It's that homogeneous. That seems to me almost constant. But it's not 0. It's one part in 10 to the 5. If you give enough time, which we have, because the universe has a long time, which is 14 billion years, and if you give me a, 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 a force which is divergent, which it is because the force of 1 over r squared is divergent, which means it can act on infinitely long scales, then you can organize these very small fluctuations into large structures, like the ones I showed you. So, these are small structures that over long enough time with the long range gravity get organized into big structures. And now the universe doesn't have one part in 10 to 5 variation. It has enormous variations. Okay, and that's why we get here, okay, in, in, in some strange way. Okay, the universe is not only simple geographically, but also simple chemically. The elements that were present then was hydrogen helium. That's it. Okay, it's hard to make just hydrogen. Without a third body, it's hard, you know, as you well know, if you're a chemist, just for molecular hydrogen without another species, well, it's uh, a dipole moment is zero. It's hard to make that reaction proceed. And helium is noble gas. So, the 
the, the outstanding question, I'll put it, is very simple. We do know that stars made this periodic table, the rest of it. But I want to know, can I explain what is the fraction, let me use something like of manganese, we always normalize to hydrogen, okay? Can I explain the abundance of these elements in the universe quantitatively? I, not qualitatively. Can I say manganese was, is more than, okay, for example, I would tell you right away that there will be more iron than any other elements in this, in this high Z, of the medium Z things, because there's something very special about nuclear chemistry uh, reactions and iron. But I want, so I was, the grand quest for me or, or is, can we give a quantitative explanation for the periodic table? Can we explain the cosmic abundances of elements in the periodic table? And for this, we must study how stars live, and particularly as you go over here, how stars die. Okay, and that's a grand quest. So if you say, what, what am I doing? I'll, I'm, I'll tell you, I'm a chemist. I'm trying to explain the periodic table for you in a quantitative fashion. Okay, so um, one of the things that I have a personal uh, choice of, it's been my, I, it's very hard for me to work in an area for more than about five years. Uh, it's a, I consider this a bit of a failing uh, because if you want to really accomplish something, I think you should stick around for, the, for most of your life. But uh, it's very difficult for me to work more than five years. I have published a few papers, I understood. I, I just can't read anything more on that. So about 2005, <coughs> I had uh, finished an eight year stint working in Gamma Reverse. I said, okay, what should I do next? And uh, so I started thinking, and one of the things that I absolutely think is important personally is uh, uh, I love teaching. Uh, I think I can tell you for sure I'm the best student in my class. I'm probably not a good teacher but I love teaching, uh, because that's how I get new ideas. So um, I always teach. In fact, I sometimes offer to teach more, and teach. I also teach the subject only three times, and then to move on, because this is the only way by which you challenge yourself to understand things. So I said, okay, I wanted uh, so I said, okay, I'll start teaching something else. So I started teaching high-energy astrophysics. Um, and then I said, okay, this is super, no problem, it's interesting. Uh, but, you know, uh, as I told you, you can always come up with ideas. Uh, I'm never very impressed. Someone says I have a great idea. Ideas are many, many times ideas are very common. They're realized simultaneously by many people. They tend to be rather generic. The trick is what do, which idea is feasible? How do you execute? Can I do it timely? Okay, it's all the practicalities. Mm -hmm. And then also you want to choose an idea as a scientist, something which is interesting but not obviously important to everyone else. Because then it will be like doing you know, one of these gazillion collaboration things where you're a member of some 5,000 people right, uh, doing something. I never understand. I would never be in a collaboration with that because even if I'm dead, no one would know them for a year. Um, anyway, so I said, OK. Um, uh, so I always like to understand which technology can I use to further my own science. So that's when and I read widely. So one of the things I noticed was that the pixel of CCDs was uh, really following Moore's law. And uh, so I said, okay, maybe we can build a camera, which would be the world's biggest camera at an affordable price, which I thought would be about maybe five to ten million dollars. But it has to be like gigantic. So about, uh, my projection was by about 2008, the prices would fall. So I started this project, and I said, okay, I want to build a factory to discuss supernovae. Until then, most astronomy, supernovae approaches were grad students, postdocs, faculty advice, you go take pictures, you come back and then you analyze that, compare, find these things, or what I call a cottage industry. That is fine, but I wanted something where you just discuss super on an industrial scale. Things would happen. Uh, and for that you need a different approach, which is a factory approach. Because you don't make cars by a small group anymore. Okay, the point in a factory is that you have to learn, factory is one about scaling of operations. Okay, so I always tell, uh, it's a joke, I know Japanese don't feel too bad, uh, annoyed, but uh, I would say if you come to Japan, the first thing you have to do is do you have to go to the Toyota factory in Nagoya. I mean, it's like fantastic. After that, if you have time, maybe you can go to Kyoto, but uh, okay. <laughs> so uh, the idea of this factory then was, uh, I said, okay, uh, since I was the director for observatories, it's a bit easy to organize things if you're the director. I said, okay, let's take this, Camera, this telescope, it's a special kind of telescope which has a large field of view. Okay. 
So it is extremely good for uh, <coughs> making images of the sky. So it's specialization. And we'll, uh, we'll uh, take images of the sky, uh, run real-time pipelines, discover stuff, which are probably candidates. Then you need to confirm, because uh, if you have a false positive in this game, it, it matters. Because if you're asking someone else to follow up your observations, and they're going to use Subaru or Cat Telescope, where the cost per night is $100,000, and if they screw up, it's maybe 5 k it's a lot of money. So this is for confirmation. And ultimately, you have to get the spectral chemical signature of that explosion, which means spectroscopy. OK, so I thought, OK, so this sort of idea of chaining <laughs> observatories or telescopes was, sounds pretty obvious, simple, and it is actually, but it has not been done in a strong way until then. OK, so um, that's what led to a program which I call as a Palomar Transit Factory. And uh, uh, we started in 2009, and we had to phase three uh, of that project, uh, called as Wiki Transit. Facility. Okay, so we have a rough idea now, and the goal of this factory eventually is we now know the sources of where these elements come from in the periodic table. Okay, there are various sources here. We have the Big Bang, small stars, supernovae, large stars, and a very small number of uh, uh, elements like lithium, uh, or maybe beryllium is made by spallation, cosmic rays, although it's not a very important process. Okay, so that's the overall theme. It will take many years to complete this grand project. Okay, um, but along the way, there are a few other things we could this uh, this factory could do is to address some of the frontier areas of, of physics and astrophysics. So one of the most interesting things is uh, energetic particles. So uh, physicists have discovered this amazing cosmic rays that have energy of over 10 to the 21 electron volts. Well, it's hard, you know, these big numbers, you should, unless you relate to it, it's very hard to understand. The fastest thrown ball happens to be a cricket ball. And if you do half mv squared for that, that's about 10 to the 20 in electron volts. Now, of course, you know that when these particles do come, you don't see people getting knocked down by cosmic rays. And that's, of course, because they have very little momentum corresponding to the energy. But they are detected, about one per year, per square kilometer, collected area. And here's the ice cube thing. It's amazing uh, telescope. Here's the ice layer in the South Pole. These are long, uh, uh, long uh, uh, steel ropes, which you have PMTs. Look at Eiffel Tower. So they, <laughs> anyway, so um, the origin of these is, uh, is hardly debated. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, in fact, uh, let's see, any physicists, I'll take a bad thing. Some physicists, they want some exotic, this model or that model. Uh, it's very simple. It's made by some natural phenomena, uh, some star or uh, maybe an explosion. It's nothing, no very deep, uh, radical reading of physics is needed. OK, uh, and then you have uh, gravitational waves, which has now become, uh, I would say, in all my life, and perhaps the biggest, uh, most amazing thing uh, I said, and I'm not even involved in that, is the discovery of gravitational waves. And something like this happened maybe 136 years ago. I don't ago think Germany. that was a discovery. What's that? I don't think that was a discovery. Detection. It was detection. Yeah, that's fine. I'll grant you that. <laughs> Absolutely. They were predicting. Yeah. Oh, this is a physicist. OK. <laughs> many people predict many things, and they only tell you when they succeed. So well, predictions will only have value when you put real money down. So if you want to make a prediction, the only person I will listen to predictions is you say, I predict this. I'm predicting one year of my salary. I will listen to that. Otherwise, predictions are cheap. I'm sorry. OK. Uh, OK, so I said, well, how do I do this factory? Well, I have a friend in uh, Santa Barbara. He's the director of the uh, Institute for Theoretical Physics, uh, KITP, uh, Las Pilsen. I was explaining to him. He said, yeah, uh, let me introduce you to a friend. And I had a lunch with this uh, friend of Lars in the Wharf of Santa Barbara. It's supposed to be from 12 to 1. It lasted about five hours. I finished at 5 p.m. Next day, this uh, person called me up. He said, sure, I like your ideas. Uh, what way can I help you? I said, well, it's simple. Give me one and a half million dollars, a six-month option period. And then I will come up with a plan and a team. And at the end of that, if I not double the money and there's no plan, you take your money back. Because I strongly believe that if you have a plan, you've got to execute. Otherwise, it's worthless. And it has to be done in some fixed time. 
Anyway, so yeah, he sent me a check. Uh, so he retired as VP for Google, and he uh, sent me a check a week later, and uh, we started this project. So we went from this lunch to first flight in 26 months, which is, I can tell you, is quite good. Okay, so we used a uh, um, uh, very uh, state of art, but uh, used uh, system from uh, Canada, France, Hawaii. It's a mosaic of very high quality science grade CCDs. We refurbished that whole cryostat. And uh, this is the camera, and the moon has been photoshopped to just to give a sense of this camera. Okay, but you know, these sorts of projects, um, uh, people confuse uh, it. The hardware is important, and now people appreciate software because now you know you can always buy a computer cheaply, but the only reason you don't want to change your computer is all the software to reinstall. Uh, so you know, everyone appreciates it. But I'll tell you there's something in more, the third stage is what I call is grayware. If you want to make these projects happen, you need some very smart people. So I went around the world and said, okay, join me in this exciting project. Either you have to pay money to join this, or you have to be, give me your brains, uh, if, if, if I valued it, I mean. So anyway, I had all these young people, so Nick Boyd finished his PhD in, in uh, Lucky Imaging. It's a certain kind of uh, uh, snapshot, a very high frame rate imaging. Anyway, so I have this other thing is I like to work with young people, and I believe if you, if you have a, the way I look at a PhD is a PhD is a license to solve a problem. You're a licensed problem solver. If you have a PhD, you should be able to solve any problem. Now, we are limited, so maybe you have a PhD. Most of us can maybe solve in astronomy if you have a person. That's fine. But in astronomy, you should be able to solve most problems. So I think it's always like young people said, yeah, you're in charge, and that's it. So the, there's no management meetings and so on we have in this group at all. So he was a project scientist, which means he led the overall uh, uh, effort. Quimby had finished his PhD from Texas, and he was a software lead, which is the worst possible job in this project, because that means you have to take all this software coming from various people and make sure they work. And you know, in this sort of project, you don't set up and have interface document specification and so on. That sort of stuff works, is, is really only important for like thousand people collaborations. Josh Bloom had finished his PhD and uh, he wanted to work on machine learning. I said, yeah, I've never heard of that term at that point. I said, well, does this stuff really work or just some standard computer science BS that I keep hearing? And uh, he convinced me. I was a little frank there. I thought it was just a lot of words you hear, you know, like AI, deep learning, all that stuff. But it, uh, I must say I was mistaken. It really worked amazingly. And I run Ofek had finished his PhD at Tel Aviv, and uh, he's one of his, uh, he was in charge of all the robotics and the sequencing. Okay, so the project took off. What is it we do? It's actually very straightforward to tell you what we do. Um, we, have, we image the sky with these large format detectors, and over time we build up what's called a reference image, which is basically we image the sky many times, we add it up in some very optimal way, remove all the blemishes, and we call that the reference. We take an image now, and you compare against that, and it is called image differencing, and it's not matrix A minus B, it's a bit more than that, there's R to that. And then you find some new object. So if you, if you have an eye which is sharp, you can see this slightly brighter here compared to this. Okay, that's a supernova. But when you do that to this here, well, you see slightly fuzzy here. And then there's, there's maybe, then you know you can't have two supernovae next to each other, and this fuzzy. And this is what the human eye is very good at. So if you, if, after an hour of training, you, you can start actually saying, what's a good subtraction and what are artifacts? And this is where machine learning. So we're the first to apply machine learning in a massive way because in the past, when people did supernova and they're finding maybe one every few nights, it's okay, you can go through it, you have the time. But our goal is to find maybe half a dozen per night, which means the amount of false positives. So which means you have to examine something like 600 to 1,000. It's not feasible to keep this up. Okay, so there are all sorts of data flows, the usual sort of things. So we have to build really robust pipelines because the data is obtained in Paloma Mountain. You have to stream it through microwave links to Berkeley, to Caltech, for subtractions to happen, sometimes there are glitches. So you can't have your pipelines that have to be very fault tolerant and still continue. You have to generate this in real time, pass it on to other telescopes to observe. You have to then rank them in some uh, order or priority. So at this point, then I realized the way out of this project is to completely automate this. And uh, so I said a statement to the group. I said the best way to do astronomy is to get the astronomers out of all these loops, uh, which annoyed some older astronomers, not in the group, I mean. They thought I was talking about them, which was true, actually. But anyway. Okay, so um, 
so that's what happened, and uh, we really got onto this uh, in a in a, this pipeline. All this uh, mainly because of all these young people. Okay. Another innovation we have to do is in order to do spectroscopy, which is with this. Um, the, the demand on this was so high, you know, while these two we took over, they're all robotic sequence and all that, but this we couldn't, the other astronomers using it too. Um, so we developed a novel spectrometer here. In order to do spectroscopy, the, and it's still the case, you get an image of the piece of sky where you want to go, there's a supernova, you get a what's an acquisition image, first, first look. Is, and then you have to take this object and put it into a slit, very fine slit, and the precision of all these things is not good enough you know, even modern telescope to do what sort of blindly putting it. That is just a drive start integration. It doesn't have that. That's, uh, these are very large structures. To get to an arc second is to really control the structure at, uh, at something like 15 microns. Not easy. Okay. So we, uh, we, uh, we adopted and devised a new type of spectrograph. It's called an IFU spectrograph. So in this spectrograph, this is the acquisition camera, this is the ad entrance aperture. It's about 30 by 30 arc seconds. Um, if you're a physicist, so I'm sorry we use arc seconds, the Sumerian system, not rect radiance, uh, but it's big, okay? Uh, so anything that goes in 30 by 30 arc seconds gets a spectrum automatically. Now that's big enough that you can slew the telescope and start integrating without human in the loop. So for example, here's Saturn in an acquisition thing. So if you put it in that thing, you would actually get a spectrum of Saturn at every point of Saturn. And these are small spectra. I mean, I, these tadpoles are actually spectra. And from that, you can see the spectrum of Saturn's body and the rings that are actually very different. Anyway, so with this, we could now do robotic rapid spectroscopy. So we now have these machines working. They do contextual analysis because we're getting a lot of events. We don't know which few we want to pursue. And uh, so one of the outstanding discoveries we had was uh, uh, we got a spectrum of an object. It looked like a supernova. It was very bright in some sense relative to its spectrum. And uh, so a, a collaborator in the team, uh, the team you know, stretches all the way from Taiwan to, to the West Coast now, which means we have all these time zones. So when we're observing at nighttime, it's in morning in, in Sweden, he, know, he, he realized that this is something odd. And so we got a, a detailed image. It turned out to be a gravitationally dense system. I'm not going to explain in detail, but let me just say what's happening here is there's a supernova here, there's another galaxy here, and there's a Peter Yode observer. Supernova is redshift 0.4. This intermediate galaxy, or what's called dancing galaxy, is redshift 0.2. They're so aligned, they're so aligned that the rays that leave the supernova get bent and magn and therefore you get a magnification of 56. So the whole thing as, as a, it's called a gravitational lens. But in order to get this alignment, which happens only maybe for one in a thousand supernovae, but only when you have these sort of large scale factories with informatics that you can start recognizing it. And then we got this adaptive optic image from Keck Observatory, and then later we also had images from the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, so I'm not really going into all the details, but again, I can assure you that this operation doesn't have people running around, actually. We don't say through the night at all. It's uh, literally, you come in, uh, if you are somewhere in, uh, in a different time zone, you can see things are happening. Uh, I, I don't say awake in the morning, morning, I can say, okay, it's like saying, okay, boys and girls, what have you done today? Let's take a look, what's interesting? Of course, the ultimate phase I want is something where I come in, and uh, the paper is written up, but that may take some time. Okay, so very quick uh, summary for those of you who like these sorts of uh, engineering details. So first one, I think we're the first to apply machine learning on a massive scale. And then we did same like spectral classification, which really required us to decrease the latency of all these processes. Uh, and uh, these are very complex uh, pipelines that are running in different parts uh, of the system. Uh, uh, in fact, parts of the world. And uh, these are some technical things. I talked about the robotic spectroscopy, and then we did a demonstration of needle in haystack, which is go to an arbitrary piece of sky, 1,100 square degrees, and find a uh, uh, afterglow of a gamma ray burst, which we know has happened. And the reason we did this exercise was for the LIGO project, where LIGO finds something the localization is known to a few hundred square degrees, and can we find the optical counterpart? So we demonstrated. 
These are all technically very hard projects because the data flows are extremely large and there's not much time. Everything has to be done quickly and reliably. Okay, so that so that was phase one and two, and then I decided. Oh, well, I was myself surprised, and you know, for for me, I was all about to wrap up because this is a long time here. But it became so successful, so uh, I proposed the Zwicky plans of facility, and that's a precursor to uh, what's called the Large Time Optics Survey Telescope. So this is a big U.S. investment. Uh, in time in ground-based astronomy. So every 10 years, astronomers in the U.S. get together, as they are now this year, and they said, okay, what shall we do for the next 10 years? Okay, And so in, in 10 years ago, they said, we are going to build the large survey, synoptic survey telescope. It's a billion dollar project. It's going to, it's going to be one of these very large data sets um, that I think many people will be talking about. You'll hear more and more talks about this. Okay. Um, so uh, there are a whole bunch of uh, innovations we did, which I uh, have gone through, but in, in view of time. There are all sorts of new fun things that are coming up, marshals and brokers, uh, about taking you know, decisions based on data and contextual data. So uh, if I convert this language of astronomy to something like expert analysis, you'll start realizing these are similar problems. So every year, a uh, few of us computer scientists, engineers, astronomers, we have a meeting at ISO. Uh, where people just talk about what they're doing. We don't even understand exactly the, the details of their field, but we understand the algorithmic nature of what people are doing. Okay, well, so um, astronomers are like mathematicians. So mathematicians would love if they write a paper and it has absolutely no utility at all. Okay, <laughs> that is the ultimate hallmark of a great mathematician. Unfortunately, it turns out so useful that almost always 10 years later, some physicists find so useful that. But uh, astronomy, uh, uh, we also, so uh, Josh Bloom, um, after the phase one of PTF, he went and founded a company called Wiser IO. Uh, and his slogan was uh, real life solutions for real life problems. And then in his brochure, he showed that how his machine learning had to actually work through the night and execute it and test it. So it's not like the Netflix challenge where you know I can issue a solution, but it will take a long time to know if my solution of what you like in Netflix is better than this one is simple. You make a quote unquote a prediction if you wish, and then next night we observe it ain't there, your algorithm's no good. Six months later we'll know who so we run all these things in parallel, we should challenge this and see who's which algorithm has a higher performance. Anyway, so he went on and then he sold his company to GE a few two years ago when the stock was still high. So I called up Josh, I said, you know, remember your old advisor, like 10% back and all that stuff. He's still not done that. Okay. Um, okay, so this led to ZTF. Now this has become, unfortunately, a large project. Or the sort of precise sort I don't like. It has something like about 40 people. Uh, but fortunately, we have no meetings, because there's one thing I don't do is meetings at all. So um, anyway, so NSF decided they allow us so much because we are a precursor to LSST, so they threw in about $11 million, and then the usual stuff, you run around the world, give me money, give me brains, there are all these institutions involved, and this led to this, uh, this uh, facility which has just come on. So um, I gave a talk, this idea, and the talk was the automated discovery of universe at MIT in 2015, and uh, there's a young man in the audience, and uh, apparently he was so impressed about uh, this automation, and uh, things that uh, he decided he'd, uh, uh, he'd uh, st so he's now started up a company uh, that seeks to do software automation. Um, so uh, I, I keep track of this. I hope when they go public, I'll call them up and say, remember 10% and to do the research, I mean. Anyway, so um, these, are, uh, these are things you really can apply, okay? And, um, about half my students go into startups and industries, which I like actually, which shows a very healthy thing. Because my view is, just because you've done a PhD doesn't mean for you're, com you're, you know, you're committed to academia for life. It just sounds like a terrible thing. It's a thing you do. You're young. You go explore. You learn new things. Then you say, what adventure can I seek? Um, OK. So this camera we built now and it's working is a, a very large camera. It has 47 square degrees on the sky. Of course, it's behind a small telescope. And uh, there are other cameras, too, which are also quite large. Here's a Japanese camera on, uh, on Subaru in, in, on Mauna Kea, um, behind an 8-meter telescope, and, and so on. So, and here's LSST, which will come up in 2022. 
10 square degrees. So we went deliberately what you call is wide and shallow. So we looked for brighter objects. That's why the small telescope is perfectly fine. So in some sense, we want to do the easy stuff, the low hanging fruit, all the bright things. So when these big telescopes come on, they'll be forced to go to fainter objects, which is a very different kind of science. Okay, these are very large engineering projects, make no mistake. Uh, despite my unusual style of management, uh, the, these things work. They're very, uh, it requires uh, dozens of engineers, uh, very smart young people to, to, to make these sorts of uh, cameras. This is the world's most compact camera. It has a CCD sensor. These are perfect CCDs, no blemishes, nothing. 1,300 square centimeters of pure silicon detectors, and the volume is extremely small. Okay, you can't you can't miniaturize anymore, uh, which is not usually a requirement. Uh, we had to rebuild this telescope, which was built in the 50s. I won't go in detail. I mean, the, a lot of engineering issues here. Okay, so uh, here's our first slide. If tonight, uh, if the sky is clear, you can go. Uh, February. Yeah. So it was. Yeah. So you should be able to see Orion uh, in the west. Uh, the big quadrilateral of Orion, and then there's a belt, and that's how big our camera is. If you, it's a big camera. Okay, and you can uh, zoom in picture, you can see the Horset Nebula, you can see Orion, a few other nebulosities, very much in detail. Okay, uh, large amounts of data flows that happens here. Um, so data is collected, uh, microwave link to IPAC at Caltech. Uh, Real-time pipelines are kicking kick in. They start generating candidates. Um, machine ranking happens. Uh, this is supposed to be an astronomer who says, "Okay." Uh, as I said, we try not to have this to be some sort of an emergency system. The whole point is to program these and say, "This is the kind of event I'm looking for," and it's routine. That's fine. Otherwise, send me a text message. But it better be something unique. So that's a lot of this very cleverness goes here, and. If there's something where, yeah, it's a routine thing, not routine, it's some program we're pursuing, automatic, so this other telescope is involved to get a spectrum. Then the data flows to the University of Washington. Uh, they're very big, uh, they're a big partner in this project because uh, they, are, they, leave, they lead uh, uh, level one data processing for LSST, and, uh, which means they're in charge of real time. Uh, and that's why they signed up. So then they package all these alerts. So we're generating of the order of a few hundred thousand alerts, so about fewer. When I say an alert, I mean, we take a picture now, we compare that to a picture taken, what we call the reference, which is the old in the sky in the past. If an object has moved, meaning it's changed in either x, y, or flux, then it's an alert, okay? So we send this alert packages out, and it's not just saying x, y, there's some contextual information I'll explain. And this is a very large data stream, and these are the alerts. This is what other astronomers are looking for. So these alerts are sent out. Uh, right now, they flow to Antares in Tucson, La Lerce in Santiago, Chile, La Serre in Edinburgh, um, and uh, LCO in uh, Santa Barbara. Okay, so these are what are called brokers. So these are people. Uh, who are, these are institutions which have decided to be, they, so if you wish, they're the retailers. We just send it to these wholesalers. And then if you as an astronomer, let's say someone in Japan wants to look at these data streams to start finding things, then you have to write all those filters and all this, and they help you how to do that. And then they even provide you some fixed number of filters. So these alert packages are actually quite complex. They consider uh, data, uh, they consider <coughs> uh, Oh, sorry, this other management, I'll skip that. Oh, these other packages have a previous history of the sky. They tell you what are the near, and is, uh, they give you machine classification of is it a star or galaxy. These are of importance to the, to the astronomers. So we, there's enough information here. At this point, if you know Python, we give you a Python library, you should be able to then say, I am now looking for this sort of phenomenon in the universe. So we have created a literally virtual dynamic universe, except it's virtual in the sense you're not observing, but it's real because it is the real universe. Okay, so these other packages can be sometimes zero if the weather is bad, and sometimes they can be very good if you're looking at a very dense field. Okay, uh, it's highly unlikely anyone at OIST really wants these alerts, but there are all these places that tells you exactly how you can access these alerts, and there's now a growing uh, body of uh, astronomers, mainly because this is the style of astronomy that LSST will be moving into. So the astronomy is, is being replaced uh, from astronomers. You know, we are 
I am successful a little bit by getting the astronomers out of the loop because now we are replacing astronomers really by people who know a lot of data management, have algorithms, computer science, and are interested in the sky. So you know, here's some fun pictures you can have, like supernovae we find. So we're finding a, we are we, we we probably have the capacity to find to have what you know we have maybe a thousand supernova candidates, but of which about a hundred is what we discover in the sense we actually take those candidates and we do spectroscopy on a limit on a certain specific subset, and uh, so these are supernovae of different sorts that we are now finding. Um, so 100 supernovae a, night a, a month is not bad, actually. That's a, a, a major jump in this business we're doing. Okay, um, so uh, let me, in view of time, um, the, you know, we are able to study, the, uh, when we, we can now see supernovae on, the la uh, like a month ago, we, we are now uh, uh, to reduce our data to see that we can actually see supernovae rise, so we can actually see the birth of the star explosion. You know, 20 minutes, no detection, 20 minutes later, little detection, 40 minutes of more detection, and exponentially rising, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, we have, it's, this is like really fun time. Um, there's one thing I sort of saw, you know, it's, the sky is so rich, you turn on a machine like this, you can write this paper. So we're writing like nature papers to So you know, ordinary papers are like one marble, but nature is like three, I think. So that's what we prefer. Okay, so let me end with uh, double degenerates, which are exotic and important stars. Now, now some of you uh, who learned English the classical way, you know, if you said someone what a degenerate person he was or she was, you would say it's an insult, which is true. But in astronomy, a degenerate star is like very precious. And a double degenerate is like extraordinary, okay? So if you, an astronomer tells you you're a double degenerate, you should say what a compliment that is. Okay, and the reason is that, as you well know, the word degenerate in this context means stars which are supported by degeneracy pressure, and that's why they're called degenerates. A double degenerate is a star with the, both members are supported by degeneracy pressure. They could be, for example, two neutron stars, they could be two white dwarfs, or neutron star black, or a neutron star white dwarf. And if I say it could be two black holes, I know I get some people completely irritated because that is a very strong statement to say it's a degenerate star. Sorry, it's a joke. Okay, um, so um, why is degenerates important? Because it's these degenerates that are really driving the forefront of astronomy. So the LIGO detection was two degenerate stars coalescing, two neutron stars coalesce. They produce so-called R process elements, including gold, platinum, and silver and the process of new black hole. Uh, but if you take two white dwarfs, they could also do the same thing if you start with a compact you know, thing. So uh, just in like in astronomy, you know, we have in radio astronomy, which is low frequency astronomy, because it's maybe 10 gigahertz. And optical astronomy is high frequency because it's 10 to the 14 hertz. So in the same way in gravitational wave astronomy, there are different bands. So the LIGO, uh, and Virgo, they, they look at roughly 10 hertz to about a kilohertz. That's their fast band. Okay, and that's what you end up seeing. But the LISA mission, which I've got with, it's a, it's a European mission, which will come up in 2034. Its fast band is one millihertz to, um, I know, maybe a tenth of a, a, 10 to minus four hertz to maybe a millihertz or something like that. That's its fast band, okay? And the, LISA is extremely sensitive to uh, double uh, white dwarfs that are going around because white dwarf is got a larger size compared to a neutron star, and your detector must have, you know, lo longer wavelengths, so you need a bigger detector. Okay, so the LISA mission is pretty amazing. You know, it'll have three uh, stations uh, in this uh, e equilateral triangle, five times uh, five million kilometers apart in an earth trailing orbit, and uh, it will go, it will be, it's really tuned to finding coalescence of supermassive black holes, coalescence of white dwarfs. So um, we're getting ready for that. That's sort of the next big frontier in gravitational wave astronomy. So I spoke a lot on uh, explosive astronomy. I didn't say anything about near-Earth asteroids. By the way, we've become very good at finding near-Earth asteroids now. Um, and uh, uh, but I also didn't speak on what I call is non-transient astronomy. But once you have this data, which is so cadenced, you can start looking for periodicities. You can look for small period objects. So, uh, grads from Kevin Verge, um, 
Uh, we decided, okay, we'll do like a massive search for the whole database. So we developed a GPU. GPUs are very good for this sort of stuff. So we uh, uh, developed a whole GPU-based uh, search for period, 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 periodicities in, uh, in unevenly sampled data. That's a technical problem. And he found a very interesting source. You know, and the part that I really like is when you can go from finding something to discover, which means understanding what it is. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so the same night, uh, uh, postdoc Mike Coughlin, we have this new facility, uh, which is kind of amazing. NSF actually gave our group this telescope for five years for free. Uh, it's a long story. Uh, I like to think it's because I'm a charming guy, but I think that's not true. <laughs> Anyway, they gave it to us, so we put on a new fast framing camera on that. So same night, Coughlin discovered that, in fact, this candidate is a eclipsing binary, and its orbital period is 6.9 minutes. So I think I've been speaking not for 69 minutes, but I think I, it's gone nine times around in the time I've been speaking. It's two white dwarfs. Uh, this is a, it's one of these diagrams. I don't have the time to explain. It's eclipsing, which is why the light disappears here. And so it's two white dwarfs going around each other in 6.9 minutes. And one is hot, the other is cold. When the cold one comes in front of the hot one, and let's say Newland is observer, when the hot light is diminished, which is why I've got a deep eclipse here. Okay, and the, you know, you from the, again, classical application of Kepler's equations, all that stuff, you can compute the, the masses uh, from spectroscopy. And here, we use the eclipse as a marker and then we went back into our old archives with the PTF data and found that object because now we knew what to look for. And we found the period is different. Okay, that's because it's been decaying. And this is the line of GR. So this is the period, there's a period derivative which fits exactly what's given by GR. So, uh, <clears throat> of course, if we had done this 20 years ago, it would have been a fantastic thing, but now it's all very well known GR, uh, experimental GR. Okay, so let me end. Uh, by saying uh, the uh, uh, concept for convergence. So convergence is when there's progress in two somewhat unrelated areas. So for example, uh, one convergence is you know, you, uh, sort of the ability to have integrated circuits. Oh, that is a big deal thing. It really miniaturizes many things. Okay. The other one was lasers. Now that came later. You know, initial lab lasers with these very bulky things, but then you're able to make solid state lasers, ever smaller things. So once you can integrate lasers with ordinary electronics, it led to a new field of photonics. And without photonics, you won't be able to operate this institute or so on because you need so much optical fibers, all that stuff is happening. So that's an example of convergence. All of a sudden it enables some new things, okay. So I would say there's a convergence happening in astronomy that's based on a certain brightness of stars and this is a bit for astronomers. Um, there's a major European mission called Gaia. It's a billion euro mission. It's doing extremely well. Uh, big projects that are happening, what's called massively multiplex spectroscopy, which is not a spectrum at a time, but 5,000 at a time. Then time domain, which is what I talked about. And then there's a whole, what I'd say, sort of algorithms, numerical astrophysics, uh, machine learning, big data method. All these are coming in. So, this is actually a very interesting time to go after this. So if you ask me, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I, I, this is a thing I specialize in to actually see fields, uh, do it before, have an IPO, make money and get out, and repeat the cycle. But this, if I, if I was younger, I'd be looking at this field. Anyway, so I organize a conference here for young people. So if you go to my web page, you can go and see it. It's a, it's a very different style of a conference, but there are some very interesting thoughts on on what this next convergence would be in astronomy, at least a convergence. So let me end by saying uh, we are the precursor to this major national project in the United States, probably in the world actually at this point. Uh, we are scaled down, so yes, it'll do more, but we are here and today, and we're writing those nature papers today and, and not five years from now. So uh, there are opportunities uh, for institutions, perhaps such as yours, to get into this whole area of astroinformatics which is a very different style of astronomy than I began. Uh, when I started grad school, you'd go to the telescope, uh, it was precious to get time, then you made a discovery. But then I could also write single author papers too, which was nice, and still is nice. But anyway, this is a new thing, so let me end by saying, uh, big facilities coming on, uh, you want to do fun things, we can do it today. 
And if you want to do times 15, you can do it five years from now. Thanks very much.